begin with the uh, opening words of the most extensive article uh, in an American scholarly journal on uh, the roots of the Bush Doctrine. That's the title of the article. Opens by stating that the promotion of democracy is central to the George W. Bush administration's prosecution of both the war on terrorism and its overall grand strategy. Now, the statement is unsurprising. In fact, by the time it was written, 2005, uh, it had really reached the level of ritual, uh, sometimes given a broader sweep. So in Britain's leading Journal of International Affairs, uh, the major article on the same topic adds, I'm quoting, that promoting democracy abroad has been a primary U.S. goal ever since Woodrow Wilson endowed U.S. foreign policy with a powerful idealist element which gained particular salience under Reagan and has been taken up with unprecedented forcefulness under George W. Bush. And in journalism and commentary, it's taken to be the merest truism, just presupposed or stated off the cuff. Well, that description of the Bush Doctrine is of obvious importance. Uh, it's adopted with uh, something approaching unanimity. Uh, and in that case, any rational person will uh, want to see the evidence on which it's based. And the results of an inquiry into that question uh, tell us quite a lot about the state of democracy. So to take an extreme example, uh, uh, suppose that uh, a similar declaration were produced in, say, North Korea. Well, we wouldn't even trouble to investigate the evidence. It suffices that the dear leader has spoken, uh, so that ends the discussion. It's true. Uh, well, in democratic cultures, in contrast, uh, substantial evidence would be demanded uh, for an important thesis like that, uh, and uh, serious argument uh, refuting apparent counter evidence. Now, what I'd like to do in this talk is to review the evidence. Uh, I think I'll try to keep it to be a fair sample on that quite crucial matter, and just to state the conclusions in advance so you know where I'm going, uh, I think, uh, which you can guess already, uh, I think that the evidence against the mantra is mountainous, and the evidence for it consists almost entirely of declarations of noble intent. And if that's even roughly accurate, I think it's much more so. And if it sounds like North Korea under conditions of freedom, uh, it should uh, disturb those who care about their country and want to do something about it. Uh, well, let's begin with the most recent empirical test of the doctrine the elections in Palestine the last couple of weeks. Uh, just a very brief word on the background. Uh, in 1996, uh, Yasser Arafat was elected president in a well-supervised election, uh, supported by the United States and Israel. And the reason was he was then fulfilling his role, uh, namely as uh, their policeman in the territories controlling the population while the United States and Israel pursued their settlement and development programs in the occupied territories, which are very clearly designed to take over the valuable land and resources and keep a stranglehold on any scattered areas uh, that they might ultimately leave to Palestinians. Uh, by the year 2000, uh, Arafat had lost U.S.-Israeli support he was not accepting their demands, and he was not controlling the population while the process continued. Accordingly, the one democratically elected leader in the Arab world was locked up in his compound in Ramallah, and the U.S. and Israel would not permit the new elections that the population demanded and that were scheduled. Now, the reasons were quite frankly explained. If there were elections, the wrong man would win. Uh, Arafat's death was greeted with great joy uh, 
unconstrained and unconcealed uh, because it uh, opened the way to uh, realize uh, the president's uh, messianic mission of bringing democracy to the region. I'm quoting from the most liberal press, but that's misleading because it was near universal. Uh, there was a think piece on the front page of the New York Times uh, just after Arafat's death. Uh, the headline was, Hoping Democracy Can Replace a Palestinian Icon. And uh, the article opens with these words. The post-Arafat era will be the latest test of a quintessentially American article of faith, that elections pro uh, provide legitimacy uh, even to the frailest of institutions. That's opening paragraph on the front page. Final paragraph on the continuation page, we read, uh, the paradox for the Palestinians is rich, however. In the past, uh, the Bush administration resisted new national elections among the Palestinians. The thought then was that elections would make Mr. Arafat look better and give him a fresher mandate and might help give credibility and authority to Hamas. Uh, so in brief, the quintessential article of faith is that elections are fine as long as they come out the right way. Actually, uh, those of you, I know this is a big center of journalism, so maybe you can answer a question for me that I often wondered about. It's very common, I've found, in reading articles like this, that the final paragraph says something significant, and that the first paragraph uh, is propaganda. And that's one of the reasons why I usually start reading articles with the last paragraph on the continuation page and then work my way up. And I, I've often wondered whether journalists do that on purpose, uh, assuming that the, edit, the first paragraph is going to be for the headline writers, and that's the one that the editors will look at. And maybe readers who get down to the end of the continuation page might be interested enough to know something. Interesting question. I leave it to you. Exercise. Uh, well, uh, let's now turn to the past few weeks. Uh, there was an election. Uh, it was permitted. Uh, on the assumption that the U.S. candidates would easily win. However, as the election day approached, it was becoming clear that the outcome was not certain. Uh, so therefore, Washington resorted to a standard methods of subversion. Uh, immediately before the elections, uh, a U.S. aide initiated development programs in an effort, I'm now quoting the Washington Post and the New York Times, in an effort to increase the popularity of the Palestinian Authority on the eve of crucial elections in which the governing party faces a serious challenge from the radical Islamic group Hamas, spending millions of dollars on quick projects to bolster the governing Fatah faction's image with voters and strengthen its hand in competing with the militant faction Hamas. Uh, that's the national press. Well, in the United States or any Western country, uh, even a hint of such foreign interference, uh, particularly from a long-standing enemy, uh, would totally destroy a candidate. But uh, deeply rooted imperial mentality legitimates such routine measures of subversion uh, of elections elsewhere uh, without comment, because it's our right. Uh, well, the attempt resoundingly failed. So we next turn to the next phase, now underway. But let me just back up slightly. On February 12th, uh, the New York Times had a review by constitutional law professor Noah Feldman of Iraq fame, as you may remember. Uh, it was a review of uh, a book uh, of collected declarations of Osama bin Laden. And the review uh, 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 runs through his descent uh, from merely horrible to ultimate evil. It uh, goes step by step. And finally, you read the review, he reached the ultimate lower depths. Quoting the review, he said, Osama made the perverse claim that since the United States is a democracy, all, student, all citizens bear responsibility for its government's actions. Uh, 
and civilians are therefore fair targets. Okay, that's plainly ultimate evil. Uh, two days later, the lead article in the New York Times announced that the United States had joined Osama in the lower depths of evil. Uh, the article reported uh, US, the uh, US-Israeli conclusion that all Palestinians bear responsibility for their government, uh, so all civilians are fair targets and must suffer for electing Hamas. That's Osama's perverse claim. Uh, Palestinians, the article explained, many follow-up ones, uh, will be held hostage and punished uh, until they elect a government favored by the United States and Israel. And a series of specific mechanisms are outlined, which I won't review. You can read them in the newspapers. There's some of them already in effect, others continuing. Uh, last week, uh, Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice was traveling through the Middle East in an effort to convince the Arab states and not to compensate for the funding cuts that are intended to starve the population into submission. Well, she failed. They don't understand democracy there. Uh, but uh, uh, in fact, only the European Union, which is easily intimidated, is willing to go along even partially. Uh, that leaves the United States and Israel in splendid isolation in adopting Osama's perverse doctrine. And in fact, for those of you who know the history, that's pretty much the way it's been for the last 30 years. Well, I don't want to pursue too many tangents, but uh, clearly uh, understanding oneself uh, should always be a very high priority. So perhaps it's worth uh, noting something that was missed in the review of Osama's descent to uh, utter barbarism. Uh, something was missed that one might imagine a respected law professor at NYU might know, as well as the editors of the New York Times. Uh, what was missed is that Osama's perverse claim has been official US doctrine for years, often stated in virtually those words. Now, there's case after case, which there's no time to review here. But I ought to mention at least the classic example, which everyone ought to know, and that's Cuba. Uh, the United States has been running campaigns of terror and economic strangulation against Cuba for over 45 years. And the reasons are explicit in the internal record, very free country. We have access to internal records, unusually so. So if we don't know about what our government is up to, that's by choice. We have more access than any country in the world. Uh, so you go back to uh, the Eisenhower administration uh, the uh, uh, high officials of the Eisenhower administration explained, I'm quoting, that the Cuban people are responsible for the regime, so the United States has the right to impose sanctions because if the Cuban people are hungry, they will throw Castro out. Uh, Kennedy came into office shortly after, and he agreed that uh, the embargo would hasten Castro's uh, uh, departure. Uh, 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 as a result of what he called rising discomfort among hungry Cubans. And to expedite that outcome, he also launched a major campaign of international terrorism. Well, so it continued. The punishment of the people of Cuba for their crime intensified when Cuba was in dire straits after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, the, was a, the author of the 1992 congressional legislation to tighten the blockade uh, proclaimed that, as he put it, my objective is to wreak havoc in Cuba so that the people will suffer and force government policy to change. That's liberal Democrat Robert Torricelli. Uh, the basic thinking was expressed right at the beginning by Deputy Assistant Secretary of State Lester Mallory in 1960, he wrote that Castro will be removed through disenchantment and disaffection based on economic dissatisfaction and hardship, so every possible means should be undertaken promptly to weaken the economic life of Cuba in order to bring, out, bring about hunger, desperation, and the overthrow of the government. And the basic thinking has not changed since. 
and the doctrine has been repeatedly applied in many countries. So what's happening in Palestine is not at all novel, uh, though it has obvious implications, uh, in particular uh, concerning the messianic mission. Well, there are, of course, reasons given for why the U.S. must adopt Osama's perverse claim and sink to the depths of uh, ultimate evil. The reasons are that Hamas's announced objectives are intolerable, and actually a pretty good case can be made for that, uh, but it's worth noticing that in basic respects, they are more forthcoming than the policies of the United States and Israel. And these policies are not just words, but they're being implemented. Well, again, time's short, so I leave that as an exercise for you, one very much worth pursuing. Maybe we can return to it in discussion later. Well, let's turn elsewhere. Uh, January 2005, Iraq held its first elections. They were very warmly welcomed by the government, uh, the government of Iran, that is. The, uh, <laughs> the foreign minister of Iran declared quoting him, that Iran supports the wishes of Iraqi citizens for a democratic government, a fully sovereign Iraq in a stable and peaceful region of democratic states. Okay, rational observers will uh, view Iran's dedication to democracy promotion with perhaps a shade of skepticism. Uh, and uh, the same is true when uh, Bush and Blair and Rice, Rice and their associates uh, issues similar pronouncements. In fact, it's far more clear in their case for reasons that it takes some effort to ignore. Uh, the most glaring of these reasons is, in fact, occasionally articulated, though very rarely. Uh, one of the few who broke ranks on this is a well-known Middle East scholar, Augustus Richard Norton, who commented accurately that as fantasies about Iraq's weapons of mass destruction were unmasked, the Bush administration increasingly stressed the democratic transformation of Iraq, and scholars jumped on the democratization bandwagon, journalists even more so. Uh, before the fantasies were unmasked, there was, of course, occasional invocation of the standard pieties about love of democracy, but not beyond the usual uh, meaningless norm. Uh, the most extensive scholarly study of official justifications for the Iraq invasion by intelligence analyst John Prados, uh, such terms as democracy are notable by their ax uh, absence, in fact, not even indexed. Well, to put it plainly, if uh, perhaps impolitely, uh, while asking us to appreciate the sincerity of their eloquent orations about the sudden conversion to democracy promotion, uh, US and British leaders are also informing us that they are among the most brazen liars in history. Uh, they drove their countries to war on the grounds of what they insistently called a single question. Will Saddam abandon his weapons of mass destruction programs? Well, by August, 2003, uh, when the tale was falling to pieces, uh, the New York Times reported that uh, as the search for illegal weapons in Iraq continues without success, uh, the Bush administration has moved to emphasize a different rationale for the war against Saddam Hussein, using Iraq as a linchpin to transform the Middle East to vibrant democracies, the new mantra. Uh, and uh, Everybody else went along. Well, that alone suffices to undermine the credibility of the different rationale, but that's only the bare beginning. Uh, nonetheless, it quickly became holy writ. Its uh, sincerity uh, passed beyond challenge after the president's address, well, publicized address at the 20th anniversary of the National Endowment for Democracy in Washington. It's November 2003. Uh, the title was Freedom in Iraq and the Middle East. The single question had by then been dispatched to oblivion, uh, replaced by Bush's messianic mission to bring democracy to the Middle East. 
so that the president's Iraq venture may be, I'm quoting, the most idealistic war fought in modern times. It's David Ignatius, the veteran correspondent, former editor of the Washington Post. Uh, with uh, considerable effort, I've found only the rarest of exceptions to this stance in media and intellectual commentary, although there are indeed critics who warn that what they call the noble and generous vision may be beyond their reach, may be too costly, the beneficiaries may be too backward, uh, not ready for democracy. Actually, evidence for that conclusion was provided uh, just as President Bush formally revealed his messianic mission at the National Endowment for Democracy anniversary celebration. Uh, right at that time, a Gallup poll was taken in Baghdad and it offered re respondents the opportunity to leap on the dem democratization bandwagon, uh, along with about 100% of commentators here. But in Baghdad, some failed to do so. 99% uh, <laughs> asked why they thought the United States invaded Iraq. 1% uh, felt that the goal was to bring democracy. 5% thought that the goal was to assist the Iraqi people. Uh, most of the rest assumed that the goal was to take control of Iraq's resources, which are phenomenal, and to reorganize the Middle East in US and Israeli interests. Now, that's called a conspiracy theory in the West. In, in the West, rational people understand that Washington and London would have been just as dedicated to the liberation of Iraq uh, if its main exports happened to be lettuce and pickles and the uh, world's energy resources uh, were located in the South Pacific. Uh, any respectable person knows that. Uh, well, quite apart from the timing uh, faith in the miraculous conversion is a little difficult to sustain uh, in view of the behavior of the missionaries just moments before. Uh, it's hard to recall any display of contempt for democracy as clear as the old Europe, new Europe distinction that was announced by Donald Rumsfeld uh, shortly before the invasion and eagerly taken up by the media and the political class. Uh, the criterion distinguishing the two categories, old and new Europe, uh, the criterion was sharp and clear. Uh, old Europe, that's the bad guys, uh, consisted of the countries where the governments uh, took the same stand as a large majority of the population. While in new Europe, the hope for the future, uh, governments overruled even larger majorities and took their orders from Crawford, Texas. Uh, therefore, old Europe is to be disparaged, as it has been, and new Europe to be lauded as the hope for democracy and enlightenment. Again, conformity was close to 100%. Actually, I couldn't find a single deviation. Uh, well, the most honored representative of new Europe was Spain's prime minister, Aznar, and he was rewarded for his love of democracy by being invited to join Bush and Blair at the summit uh, which announced the invasion of Iraq. That was shortly after polls in Spain uh, showed that Osnar was backed in his support for the war by 2% of the Spanish population. Uh, the, uh, this display of hatred for democracy reached its peak when the government of Turkey actually followed the will of 95% of the population, much to everyone's surprise, and rejected Washington's demands. Uh, Turkey was bitterly condemned in the national press for lacking what were called democratic credentials. Uh, Colin Powell, you recall the official dove, uh, announced harsh punishment for this defection from good order. Uh, the most extreme was Paul Wolfowitz, who berated the Turkish military for not compelling the government to follow Washington's orders. He demanded that military leaders apologize to the United States and say, I'm quoting him, they're supposed to say, we made a mistake. Let's figure out how we can be as helpful as possible to the Americans. 
and that would demonstrate their understanding of democracy. So it's maybe small wonder that he was designated idealist in chief uh, by David Ignatius of the Post, uh, though he's not without flaws. Ignatius went on to say that he might be too idealistic, uh, so much so that his passion for the noble goals of the war in Iraq might overwhelm the prudence and pragmatism that normally guide war pl uh, planners. Actually, that's only one of innumerable accolades to this heroic figure whose passion is the advance of democracy, uh, one of the most consistent themes of his career. I'm just uh, selecting a few typical phrases from the elite liberal press. Uh, the accolades, and there were many, scrupulously ignored his record which is one of consistent and appalling contempt for human rights and democracy. It goes back to his Reagan administration days and since. Uh, to mention just one example, he was perhaps the most enthusiastic supporter of General Suharto of Indonesia, and he actually persisted even after this grand mass murderer and torturer who ranks with Saddam Hussein even after he was abandoned by Washington when he committed his first crime in 1998, namely dragging his feet on IMF orders and failing to control the population. Uh, Wolfowitz, as you probably know, uh, went on to become president of the World Bank, where his main mission was explained in the press as uh, to control third world corruption. Uh, uh, that's what the bank's not going to concentrate on. And he has real experience in that, just as much as with uh, <laughs> human rights and democracy. His great friend Suharto was ranked by Transparency International, which monitors international corruption. Uh, Suharto is ranked as far and away the most corrupt leader. Uh, his uh, robbery of the Indonesian people probably approximates their strangling, the debt that's strangling the country. Uh, the second one, I think, was Mobutu, who was way behind him. Uh, so this is all under Wolfowitz's tutelage and with his support. So he's in a good position to undertake that task, too. Uh, well, uh, meanwhile, uh, Bush and company uh, pursued their mission in the traditional domain of U.S. power, Latin America. Uh, in 2002, they supported a military coup to overthrow the elected government of Venezuela, uh, but they had to slink away in the face of overwhelming opposition and condemnation in Latin America, uh, where the population uh, also seems to be deficient in their understanding of democracy, uh, and therefore does not admire US-backed military coups to overthrow elected governments. Uh, after a popular uprising restored the government, uh, Washington turned to subversion under the natural guise of supporting democracy. That's what's now underway. And again, such actions by a foreign government within the United States would never be tolerated, particularly after they had just supported a military coup to overthrow the civilian government. But again, the imperial mentality allows them, uh, in a traditional dependency, allows them to proceed without comment. Check and see. Uh, there's an official justification for this. The official justification is that the Chavez government in uh, Venezuela is not democratic. And that's easily proven. Uh, Washington opposes it. Uh, accordingly, it can have no relevance that Chavez has repeatedly won monitored elections and referenda despite bitter media hostility, nor does it matter that his popularity ratings are very high uh, or that Latin America's major polling organization recently found that while satisfaction with democracy continues its ominous decline throughout Latin America, uh, there are a few exceptions. Uh, leading the list of exceptions is Venezuela, where support for democracy climbed sharply to 75% through the Chavez years, and the country now leads Latin America in support for the elected government. Uh, just a few days ago, the polls released by the North American Opinion, by North American Opinion Research, uh, found that two-thirds of the population intend to vote for Chavez in the next election, and four percent for the next highest candidate, the opposition candidate. Uh, 
But what Venezuelans think is plainly irrelevant. Our leader has spoken, uh, so therefore uh, the government's anti-democratic. Uh, well, though the facts are not uncontroversial, uh, actually these familiar patterns have, I should say, been followed elsewhere as well, not just in Latin America, but all over, including Central Asia, uh, where the Bush administration has been an enthusiastic supporter of some of the world's uh, most awful tyrants, uh, torturers and, and uh, murderers. And that's not suppressed. The facts aren't controversial, they're reported, but there's an explanation quote the New York Times, uh, they explain that in a region of bases, energy, and big power rivalries, ideals require patience. So we have to temper our passion for democracy and human rights with deep regret. Well, I won't run through the rest of the world, but uh, again, I urge you to do it, and I think you'll find consistent results. Uh, the strongest witnesses for the defense of the authenticity of the messianic mission should be the leading scholars and the most enthusiastic uh, advocates of democracy promotion. Uh, the most prominent among them is the director of the Democracy and Rule of Law Project at the Carnegie Endowment, Thomas Carruthers, uh, who identifies himself as a neo-Reaganite, uh, agreeing with uh, scholarship that Wilsonian idealism took on particular salience under Reagan's leadership. Uh, just a year after the invasion of Iraq, uh, just after the messianic mission had officially replaced the single question, uh, Carruthers published a book reviewing the record of democracy promotion by the United States since the end of the Cold War. That's an interesting book. He finds what he calls a strong line of continuity running through all administrations in the post-Cold War era, including Bush number two, namely, democracy is promoted by the United States if and only if it conforms to strategic and economic interests. Uh, he finds that all administrations are schizophrenic, it's kind of a psychological disorder of some kind, uh, with very puzzling consistency. Well, Carruthers uh, also wrote the standard scholarly work on democracy promotion in Latin America in the 1980s. Now that he wrote in part from an insider's perspective. Uh, he was serving in the Reagan State Department in the programs of uh, democracy enhancement. And Carruthers reviews the programs. He regards them as sincere, uh, but he points out that they were a failure and he's an honest scholar, he points out that they were a systematic failure, uh, where U.S. influence was least in South America, progress toward democracy was greatest, uh, despite Reagan's attempting to impede it uh, by embracing right-wing dictators. Uh, where U.S. influence was strongest, meaning the regions nearby, progress was least, and the reasons, Carruthers explained, are that Washington would tolerate only limited top-down forms of democratic change that did not risk upsetting the traditional structures of power with which the United States has been allied in quite undemocratic societies. So in short, the strong line of continuity goes back a decade earlier uh, to the Reagan years when the powerful idealistic element in traditional U.S. policy uh, gained particular salience, according to scholarship. Uh, nonetheless, uh, the dedication of our leaders to the principle is beyond question, and today we must believe that Bush is dedicated to the messianic vision of creating a sovereign democratic Iraq and bringing democracy everywhere. Well, in fact, the strong line of continuity goes back much farther. Uh, democracy promotion has always been proclaimed as a guiding vision, and it isn't even controversial that the U.S. regularly overthrew parliamentary democracies, uh, often installing or supporting brutal tyrannies, uh, Iran, Guatemala, Brazil, Chile, long list of others. Uh, there were Cold War pretexts but they regular, regularly collapse on the slightest investigation. 
Well, in his 2004 book, uh, Carruthers predicted with regret that Washington's Iraq policies would extend the strong line of continuity. In his words, he feared that they will likely exhibit similar contradictions between stated principles and political reality. And in fact, those predictions were being fulfilled as his book went to press. Uh, the occupation authorities uh, tried in every way they could to avert the threat of democracy in Iraq, but they were compelled with great reluctance to abandon their plans to impose a constitution uh, and to prevent elections. Uh, very few competent observers, none that I know, would disagree with the editors of the world's leading business newspaper, the London Financial Times, that the reason the elections took place was the insistence of the Grand Ayatollah Ali Sistani, who vetoed three schemes by the US-led occupation authorities to shelve or dilute elections. The veteran Middle East correspondent Patrick Coburn, very knowledgeable uh, and incidentally non-embedded, uh, adds that uh, it was only when it became clear that the United States could not withstand a Shia uprising that elections turned out to have been an American goal all along. Uh, in, in fact, the elections were a triumph of mass nonviolent resistance, which compelled the occupiers uh, to allow them to take place, and then routinely, of course, uh, took credit for them. Well, although compelled to tolerate elections, uh, the occupying forces at once tried to subvert them, exactly as in Palestine in the past few months. There was a U.S. candidate, Yad Alawi. He was given every possible advantage, uh, state resources, access to television, support of the military occupation, and so on. And here, too, as in Palestine, subversion was a resounding failure. Got about 12% of the vote. And Washington is now trying equally desperately to control the consequences, which isn't easy when U.S.-British polls indicate that 80% of the population wants a fixed timetable for withdrawal and almost half approve of attacks against U.S.-British troops. That's the whole country. Take a look at the Arab areas where they actually are. The figures are much higher. Well, to ensure that the elections would be free, uh, the U.S. expelled the most important media from the country, uh, notably the Qatar-based station Al Jazeera, which is despised by the ruling tyrants in the region because it's been a leading force for democratization in the Arab world. And that alone makes its presence before elections uh, in Iraq inappropriate. And uh, the background uh, tells us a little more uh, about the messianic mission. For years, high officials uh, in the United States, uh, Cheney, Rumsfeld, Rice, Powell, and others, have been pressuring Qatar to curtail Al Jazeera's reporting. Uh, the U.S. bombed its facilities in Kabul and Baghdad, killing a Jordanian correspondent there. Uh, U.S. pressure, now quoting the New York Times, uh, U.S. pressure was so intense that the government is, of Qatar is accelerating plans to put Al Jazeera on the market, though Bush administration officials counter that a privately owned station in the region uh, may be no better from their point of view. So we have another demonstration of Bush's vision of democracy in the Middle East. No media can be tolerated that are not under US control, whether public or private. Well, without going on, it's dismally easy. It's clear enough that the Iraq calamity again illustrates the strong line of continuity, very much as Carruthers had anticipated. And that shouldn't be surprising, given the unusual significance of Iraq in geopolitical and economic terms, and the fact, which should be obvious enough, that a sovereign and moderately democratic Iraq could easily turn into a nightmare for Washington, maybe the ultimate nightmare. I have to leave that one, too, as an exercise for the reader, but think it through. Uh, beyond declarations of leaders and the 
self-refuting case of Iraq, uh, several additional bits of evidence have been put forward uh, to justify the faith and the sincerity of the messianic mission. So the most heralded are Lebanon, Egypt, and Palestine. So let's turn to these. Uh, the case of Lebanon can be dismissed unless the CIA is taking credit uh, for the bombing that killed Prime Minister Rafik Hariri, which set off uh, the anti-Syrian demonstrations that did lead to a complex but significant uh, opening of Lebanese society. Well, such speculations are hardly credible, uh, but one could understand why they might have some resonance in, in Beirut. Uh, perhaps Lebanese have not forgotten the most horrendous car bombing in Beirut, it was in 1985, an important year in the history of journalism. Uh, that was the year when uh, Middle East terrorism was ranked the most important story of the year in an annual poll of editors. Uh, the reason was to look back because of two cases uh, in each of which one American was killed. The 1985 car bombing in Beirut, the same year, it caused a huge explosion killing 80 people, wounding 200, uh, most of them women and girls, uh, leaving the mosque where the bomb was placed. Uh, the attack was aimed at a Muslim cleric who escaped. Uh, but that didn't figure in the poll of editors, and it's out of Western history and mainstream scholarship on terrorism and all journalism on terrorism. And the reason is very simple. The bombing was traced back to the CIA and Saudi intelligence, apparently with British help. Well, without pursuing the matter further, we can surely exclude Lebanon from the canon. So let's turn to Egypt. Uh, there is an important popular movement for change uh, in opposition to the US-backed Mubarak dictatorship. It's called Kifaya, enough. It was formed in the year 2000. It was largely sparked by the Palestinian Intifada. The leading elements in the movement were the Palestinian solidarity groups and continuing U.S.-backed Israeli atrocities in the occupied territories stimulated the Egyptian reform movement further, so its leaders point out, and it was then joined by the massive opposition to the war in Iraq. Uh, the spokesperson for Kifaya stresses that it is an anti-imperial movement with goals extending beyond the democratization of Egypt. So the democratization movement in Egypt doesn't look like a very good candidate for the sincerity of the messianic mission and its impact either. So let's turn finally to Washington's dedication to democracy promotion for Palestine. Uh, here, as we see to the present moment, the strong line of continuity prevails along with its paradoxical quality. Inexplicably, deeds consistently accord with interests and conflict with words. Uh, these discoveries must not, however, uh, weaken our faith in the declaration of our leaders. Uh, and if that sounds like an unmentionable country, I can't help it. Uh, Bush uh, proceeded to amplify his vision, as the press always calls it, uh, by endorsing Israel's takeover of settlement blocks in the West Bank uh, to uh, solidify control over the regions uh, that uh, uh, the U.S. and Israel are now effectively incorporating behind the separation wall. Uh, that's in defiance of a world court judgment uh, reaffirming the conclusion of the Security Council and others uh, that it violates international law. There was one dissent to the world court ruling, U.S. Justice Bergenthal, but he dissented on very narrow grounds. Uh, he agreed with the court on the crucial issues, to quote Bergenthal's separate declaration, the Fourth Geneva Convention and international human rights law are applicable to the occupied Palestinian territory and since all Israeli settlements in the occupied territories are in violation of the convention, the segments of the wall being built by Israel to protect the settlements are ipso facto in violation of international humanitarian law. It's about 
85% of the wall, according to Human Rights Watch. Uh, and the same holds for the other US-backed Israeli actions to take over that valuable land and resources, leaving the area fragmented, uncontroversially, all blatantly illegal in violation of the foundations of international humanitarian law as just ruled again by the World Court unanimously. Uh, the actual meaning of the US-Israeli programs is very clear from a look at the maps. Uh, if you look, you find that the basic plan uh, includes two major salients extending from Israel through the West Bank. That creates three cantons virtually separated all of them virtually separated from whatever is to be left of Arab East Jerusalem, which is the center of Palestinian commercial, cultural, political life. It's where the institutions are, hospitals and everything else. Uh, the Israeli settlements and the massive infrastructure projects are to be incorporated within Israel with Bush's blessing, uh, leaving the remaining fragments in Palestine unviable uh, with the expectation that the population will either leave or disappear from sight in something that may be called a state. Uh, and just recently it was formally announced that Israel will hold the Jordan Valley from which Palestinians are being removed in favor of uh, subsidized Israeli settlers. Uh, that means that the remaining cantons will effectively be prisons, uh, much like Gaza, uh, which is described by uh, Israeli human rights organizations as the world's largest prison. Uh, well, there's no time here to review the diplomatic record during the 38 years of the occupation, but it is so consistent and so extensively documented that it takes real diligence and subordination to power, not to see it and to comprehend it. The record reveals with dramatic clarity that throughout this whole period, uh, 30, over 30 years clearly, uh, the US has unilaterally barred an overwhelming international consensus on a two-state political settlement, and it still does uh, more forcefully today than ever before and now that it is guided by the president's inspiring vision. Actually, there's been one departure in this consistent rejectionism. Now, that was in January 2001. It's the last month of Clinton's administration. For one week in January, high-level Israeli and Palestinian negotiators met in Taba and came fairly close to reaching an agreement that was sort of approaching the long-standing international consensus. However, Israel called off the negotiations. Uh, the two parties then issued a joint statement uh, declaring that they have never been closer to reaching an agreement, and it is thus our shared belief that the remaining gaps could be bridged with the resumption of negotiations. Well, negotiations were not resumed, Bush came in, uh, but they did continue unofficially, and they led to the announcement of the Geneva Accord, as it's called, in December of 2002, was released in Geneva, uh, based on discussions with high-level uh, negotiators on both sides. Uh, actually, the Geneva Accord came very close to the international consensus, which is overwhelmingly favored internationally, and is incidentally favored by a large majority of Americans. Uh, the Geneva Accord was welcomed publicly by most of the world. It was rejected by Israel, was simply dismissed by Washington. Uh, there was a report about it in the New York Times, a very disparaging article, you know, who are these guys? Uh, we don't accept it, so goodbye. Uh, and it disappeared very quickly from the media here, although the efforts continue among Israelis and Palestinians. Well, the centerpiece for the Bush Sharon programs for takeover of the West Bank, uh, uh, the centerpiece is presented as a Gaza disengagement plan that offers new hopes for peace. And that was a huge media frenzy last 
uh, summer and fall, as you may recall, one of the big stories of the year. Uh, the uh, motives for, uh, the actual motives for disengagement were pretty clear. Uh, sane U.S.-Israeli rejectionists surely wanted Israel's illegal settlements removed from Gaza. It's been turned into a complete disaster area under the occupation. There are a few thousand Jewish settlers taking much of the land and the scarce resources and protected by a large part of the Israeli army. And that's absurd. And far more reasonable for U.S.-Israeli goals is to leave Gaza as a prison in which Palestinians can rot, uh, cut off from contact with the outside and with few means of sustenance. And then when they riot or do something terrible, we can say, well, that just shows how bad Palestinians are, so obviously we can't deal with them. Uh, there was uh, very little attempt to conceal the fact that the Gaza pullout was in reality an expansion plan. Uh, as the disengagement plan was made public, uh, the Israeli government announced very publicly uh, that Israel will invest tens of millions of dollars in West Bank settlements as it withdraws from the Gaza Strip. Uh, this was reported here, bolstering West Bank settlement blocks. Understanding the salience is fragmented of territories. Harvard Mideast scholar Sarah Roy is a leading academic specialist on the occupation. Uh, she writes that under the terms of the disengagement, Israel's occupation is assured. Chasms will be contained and sealed within the electrified borders of the Strip. While West Bankers, their lands dismembered by relentless Israeli settlement, paid for by the usual uh, kind donor, namely you. Uh, thanks to, uh, uh, while uh, relentless Israeli settlement will continue uh, to be penned into fragmented geog uh, geographic spaces, isolated behind and between walls and barriers. And that, she says correctly, appears unavoidable uh, as long as the United States backs Israel's takeover of anything of value to it in the West Bank. Well, without proceeding, uh, even the bare outlines make it clear enough that Palestine joins the other illustrations of Bush's messianic mission to bring peace and democracy and justice to the Middle East and the world. Uh, you may search for other examples to see if I've skipped some relevant ones. Uh, the uh, persistence of the strong line of continuity to the present worldwide reveals that the United States is very much like other powerful states. Uh, it pursues the strategic and economic interests of dominant sectors of the domestic population to the accompaniment of impressive uh, rhetorical flourishes about its exceptional dedication to the highest values. Now that's practically a historical universal. I'm including the worst monsters, Hitler, Stalin, uh, Mussolini, uh, uh, Emperor Hirohito. Uh, if we had records from Genghis Khan, we'd probably find the same thing. I can't find an example of a brutal monster or anyone else who didn't proclaim uh, what is called American exceptionalism. Uh, it was probably believed by their own subjects. Uh, well, that's the reason why nobody with a br brain cell functioning uh, pays the slightest attention to declarations of uh, noble intent by leaders or accolades by their followers. They're predictable, and therefore they carry no information. I mean, even in a technical sense of information. Uh, there is a general guiding principle, and it's sort of illustrated and quoted. The guiding principle is that abroad, democracy is fine, but only as long as it takes the top-down form that does not risk popular interference with the primary interests of power and wealth. And in fact, very much the same doctrine holds internally. It's a topic that should be of very great importance to us and uh, to the world, because what happens here has much broader 
significance because of the uh, extraordinary power and influence of the United States. Well, there's no time to go into that, uh, but I'd like to end with just a few words about the topic because, because uh, they, I think, provide some useful and simple ideas as to how to approach the grave problems that uh, confront all of us. So here are a few suggestions. First, accept the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court and the World Court. Uh, second, sign the Kyoto Protocols and carry them forward. Third, uh, let, let the United Nations take the lead in international crises. Fourth, uh, rely on diplomatic and economic measures rather than military ones in confronting the grave threats of terror. Five, keep to the conventional interpretation of the United Nations Charter, conventional conservative interpretation, the use of just what its words say. Now, the use of force is legitimate only when ordered by the Security Council or when the country is under imminent threat of attack until the Security Council can act. That's Article 51 of the Charter. Sixth, give up the veto at the Security Council and have a decent respect for the opinions of mankind, as the Declaration of Independence advises, uh, even if power centers disagree. Seventh, uh, cut back sharply on military spending and sharply increase social spending. Health, uh, 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 health, education, renewable e energy, and so on. Actually, for people who believe in democracy, these are very conservative suggestions. And if there were any conservatives in the country, they'd all be in favor of them. And there's a very simple reason for it. These are the opinions of the majority of the U.S. population. Uh, in most cases, the overwhelming majority. They're in radical opposition to public policy. In most cases, a bipartisan consensus. Now, very few citizens are aware of these facts, and there's a reason. Uh, these are in-depth public opinion studies taken at very crucial moments by the most prestigious institutions, but they are scarcely reported, in some cases not reported at all, uh, when they reveal facts like these, as they regularly do. And that record is highly instructive, especially for people who are interested in democracy promotion at home. Well, these are far from the only constructive suggestions that one can think of, but they're a pretty good start. Uh, and there are also, they can be supplemented with some simple truths that can be quite useful if we abide by them. The one is to take democracy seriously. Another is to pay some attention to fact and elementary moral principle. Another is to refuse to accept the self-serving contention of the powerful that what happened in the past can be forgotten uh, because we have undergone a miraculous uh, change of course, uh, something that happens every few years as easily demonstrated, and other simple truths. Uh, they don't answer every question by any means, uh, but they do carry us a considerable way forward toward developing more specific and detailed answers, and more important, uh, they open the way to implementing them, uh, opportunities that are readily within our grasp if we can free ourselves from the shackles of doctrine and imposed illusion.